The last chapter gets us to Aaron Burr. I didn't initially intend to have him close off the book, but he sort of put himself forward as a logical choice. The last chapter talks about the presidential election of 1800 and really looks at it as a case study of all the other weapons I've been talking about all in use in one big mess in that presidential election, which is, was indeed a very big mess. Um, and those of you who aren't familiar with the story of it, it ends up, there ends up being a tie between Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson, who are both of the same party, which is not necessarily what they would have called it, but they're both Republicans, and Burr was supposed to be the vice presidential candidate, but in this period, there was no vice presidential sort of separate ballot. Basically, you just voted, and whoever got the most votes was president, and whoever got the second most votes was vice president, and there it was. So in this case, they, got, they ended up with a tie vote, and this ends up being a, a massive, massive mess. Um, Burr doesn't step forward and say, um, I don't know, I'm not supposed to be president. Mr. Jefferson, please, after you, I will step back and be what I was intended to be, which is vice president. He doesn't step back. He just remains silent, which Jefferson never forgives him for, never trusts him again. And this moment, actually, even more than the duel with Burr, this is sort of the, the, the death moment of Burr's political career, because Jefferson and his friends never trust Burr again. Burr referred to them ever thereafter as the Virginia Junto. <laughs> they were just a gang of Virginians who were out to get him. But the chapter, in addition to showing all of these weapons in play in this election, looks at it through the eyes of Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr wrote his memoirs in his last couple of years. And one of the main points, basically his memoirs, they're fascinating because um, Burr is not someone who is known for his political ideals or ideas or principles or ask, actually his politics at all. He was really an opportunist. And his memoirs are organized, they're divided basically into three sections, which as far as I can tell are Guys I Hate by Aaron Burr. <laughs> George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson. And there are his memoirs. And he just goes from one guy I hate to the next guy I hate. And it fills two volumes, actually. He hated them a lot. <laughs> but the, the main point of the volume is that underneath all of these horrible things and these guys I hate behaving horribly towards me, the worst of all is Thomas Jefferson and this election of 1800. Because Jefferson claimed ever thereafter that Burr was corrupt that Burr had done some nasty finagling at the last minute to try and become president, and it hung, it sort of was on Burr for the rest of his life. He couldn't quite brush off that charge. Burr says in his memoirs, no, actually, Jefferson was the one who negotiated and cheated his way into the presidency. Now, of course, who would believe Aaron Burr? Not very many people would believe Aaron Burr, and clearly his memoirs were not a bestseller, so not even very many people even bothered to read what Aaron Burr had to say. But... <laughs> What I show in this chapter is basically if you understand the politics of the period and you understand all of the subtle sort of um, seemingly apolitical ways in which these guys are, are politicking, you discover that actually Jefferson did make something of a deal. Now this is where I'm really going to be struck by lightning, I can tell. <laughs> um, I discovered actually a, a legal deposition um, which apparently hasn't been used very much before, by someone who was involved in that election, the, the ending of that election, trying to break the tie. And there's one line in that deposition that just reveals a lot. Um, essentially, there's a moment in this election. It's tied, it's tied, it's tied. They vote 35 times in Congress to break the tie, and they can't. And they think there's literally going to be civil war. There are guys arming in Pennsylvania and Virginia to seize the government for Jefferson if he doesn't get it. So this is actually rather serious. And Federalists keep going up to Jefferson and saying, you know, we'll vote for you if you'll just do these four things. And they have, you know, four things that they want, like don't take apart the Treasury Department, you know, don't destroy commerce, they're sort of goofy things. But they want Jefferson to promise, basically, that he's not going to tear apart everything that they've built up over the last 10 years. And Jefferson keeps saying, as you think he would, I will not be bound by any promises, I will not enter office on any sort of promise, I can't do it. Last, the last minute, Things are looking very bad, and a friend of Jefferson goes to visit him, the fellow who made out this legal deposition, and he says, um, you know, those Federalists are really pretty persistent about these, these four issues, and I, I don't know what to do. And Jefferson says, well, you know, I won't be bound by any promises. I will not enter this office to be bound by any promises. I will not do it. And then there's a pause, and then he says, but friend to friend chatting around the dinner table. 
I can talk to you about the issues in those questions. And he then goes one, two, three, four, talks about each of the four issues, not only says to this fellow what he'll, he would do about them, but even gives him footnotes, basically. Look in notes on the state of Virginia, page five, where it says like, So he basically offers this guy a little script on what to do to go back to the Federalists. He has not made a deal, and so he said for the rest of his life, I made no deal because he was just chatting with a friend. However, Burr then has some reason to claim that he did make some kind of a deal. That's the wonderful thing about this sort of dinner table politicking, is that it's very slippery and seemingly <laughs> invisible. And in this case, really allowed Jefferson to do something that he could honestly deny for the rest of his life, but again, a questionable moment that you would never notice unless you understood all of this other, um, all of these other aspects about the politics of the period. So that gives you at least a sense of what I'm doing, which is really, um, a very new way of looking at national politics, really try rediscovering the political narrative that we thought everything has been said about and it's all dead and gone. I'm really discovering a lot of new stories and a very new way of doing political history and the history of this period. Thank you.